Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about healing from the tragedy of clergy and therapist abuse. I'm honored to have special guest Amy Nordhues. Amy is the author of Preyed Upon. She is also an abuse survivor and an advocate for victims of clergy and therapist abuse. You can learn more about Amy and her book at her website, amynordhues.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Amy. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I read your book, Preyed Upon, and I thought, wow, this is a brave woman. First of all, I am so proud of you for breaking free and for the ripple effect that that breaking free had immediately to help other people. And so as we talk about this today, um, there's so many important things to, to talk about where we have people in trusted, respected position who use that position of authority and trust to hurt us instead of to help us. So would you please just briefly share your story with our listeners? Yes, in 2013, I began to see this therapist. He was also a psychiatrist and an elder at my church. So I really felt like I was in good hands. He came highly recommended. Um, I went to see him for reasons of like lingering depression that I never could really shake. And I'm sure that's from, you know, childhood sexual abuse and repeated sexual abuse in my life. Um, And then just, you know, issues surrounding parenting and my marriage was very disconnected. And so that's what brought me to him. And I thought, you know, I also became a new believer in 2012. Um, And when I say that, I mean, I've always been a Christian, but my faith really came alive for me around that time. So this guy being a church elder, I thought, wow, this is a God thing that I'm here. Like, this is so awesome. And this is part of my healing journey that God has me on. And, you know, the therapy was also very spiritual, which was made it hard for me to, you know, spot the red flags because we would open our sessions in prayer. Um, A lot of it was talking about bringing Jesus into the broken places and, um, and things like that. So another kind of weird piece to the therapy was he told most of his victims, I realize now that we had multiple personalities, which I know that I don't have, but he put it like on a spiritual level to where I'm like, well, we all could have that then if it's something we can have and not really remember or know about. So I just, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought it was a God thing that I was there and thought, you know, would it kill you to try? Would it kill you to give him a chance? Because you've you've been depressed most of your life, you've tried everything. So it's kind of, you know, in that desperate place of just trust him and see and just go with it. And I did think it was helping, you know, I think just having somebody to talk to each week and have someone who's, I didn't realize grooming me, but somebody who's, you know, pouring into me and trying to lift me up and uh, wanting to know me and see me and, and those things were helping me at first. So, you know, when there was a red flag, I think the first time was probably, I started seeing him like in April and it was about December. So I really trusted him by then. He was like a father figure. Um, When he offered to rub my shoulders or my feet for a Christmas present, it was shocking and terrifying. But, you know, all the voices in my head started up that, and I realize now these are like tapes from that I learned in childhood that Amy, people in a position of authority don't make bad decisions. So if there's something he's doing that's making you feel uncomfortable, the problem lies with you. And I know that sounds ridiculous because we know that people in positions of authority misuse that all the time. But when you have been abused young, you feel like you've lost your right to say no. And you feel like you don't have the same value that other people do. So therefore, this person is more highly valued more highly respected, um, so the problem must lie with me. So the relationship continued that way, and when he would do something that made me anxious, he would kind of slow down, and then when I was feeling more relaxed, he would you know, speed up the pace, and it was about a year in total when I realized I was in serious trouble, and I felt like he was just trying to lure me into an emotional affair, which I had no interest in him being like my father. 
and then it eventually turned to sexual assault and I was finally able to leave. That is kind of the story in a nutshell. And that is a, a that is sufficient to get the conversation going. So if anyone who's listening wants to hear the rest of the story, I recommend the book. It is, um, th there might be a, a trigger for people who have struggled with abuse, but if you're trying to understand from the outside of how could this happen to an adult, um, I think it's very helpful. And I love as you're going through and explaining the story that you give what you call the rules. And you explain what is going on in your head of why these, these red flags were able to be uh, dismissed. Right. Because it, it, like you said, you know, people in authority don't make bad decisions. So anything that's wrong it has to be with me. Anything that makes me feel uncomfortable, it's my fault. I am not as important as someone else is. And as you go through and you explain this thought process, it's very helpful to say, or to see how that could be. And then as you healed, you gave a new set of rules. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love how you changed the way that you felt about yourself and the way that you see the world around you and interpret the world around you. And that one just pivotal part that just you know gave me chills was that transition from you know, I am garbage to, you know, I am a daughter of the king. And I thought, oh, man, yeah. if we can all just internalize that one, then so everything changes. The way yeah. we see the world changes, the way we see ourselves changes, everything changes. And as I read through that, it, it reminded me a little of that. I don't know if you've heard the story of the frog in the pots, how, you know, if you want to cook a frog, if you stick a frog in hot water, it'll jump out. But if you put it in cool water, well, that feels good. And then, um, you know, warms up a little, lukewarm is fine. Warm water actually feels good. And by the time it's too hot to get out, it's too late. Right. right. And that patient, patient grooming of this really creepy, creepy, disgusting man. He was so careful to, to just, you know, make just, just a little bit uncomfortable until you're used to that. Okay. Now that's normal. Okay. Now we're going to do one more thing. I, I just, the patience of, Oh yeah. Uh, ooh, creepy. Yeah. Okay. Right. So enough of the gross let's, let's work more toward the, <laughs> the healing angle. Cause I don't want to stay in that yucky place. Um, but I'm, I'm so proud of you and, and that wake up moment where he said something and he said a lot of really weird things, but somehow you didn't buy this one at all. And it was just no. And it, I, it, I could feel this mental click of no, that is not okay. And then, and then things started to change. So do you want to explain a little bit about this healing journey of how you just woke up to a whole new Amy? Yeah. In fact, even when you said that, it gives me chills because it was such a pivotal moment in my life for the first time, being able to look at another human being that I would always put as above myself um, and say, this is absolutely not okay and will not continue for me to have that much you know, I guess power, you could say, I, you know, I never had that in my life to be able to turn around and walk away, even though it took me a long time to get there. I was able to leave. I think I say, I was noticing that this time when I left his office, I didn't look back. And that's kind of, you know, I know, yay. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> but, you know, it was a slow process. Um, it was a slow breaking away process, but it happened in stages, you know, kind of like that was the first kind of pivotal moment. And then, you know, I wanted to leave without telling a soul because I was so embarrassed and so ashamed about what had happened. Um, and that didn't work. I, I tried and he would weasel his way back in. He would guilt me. He would cry. He would call me. So I finally broke down and um, told my pastor and his wife and um he seemed to believe me. I'm sure he was in shock. And um, I really would just told them so that they could help me break the tie. And they were like, what do you need? And I said, I just need somebody to sit with me for that, you know, first session where I don't show up. And, um, and they did. 
And then that was another small victory where I really could feel the chains fall off at that point. I mean, I was still attached to him in a very twisted way that I don't understand. Um, but I knew I wouldn't go back. So, you know, that was kind of the next step. And then I went off, I had a pre-planned vacation with a friend, which was just heaven sent. And I was able to really kind of dump all the pieces out onto a table and, and look at it objectively. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think I've been manipulated this whole time. And, and at first I thought he started manipulating me in December. And I'm like, no, started on day one. And my mind was just blown. I didn't even know that adults could be groomed. I knew children could. And um, that's when it all kind of started coming together. And I had to really start to accept the fact that this was a sociopath that didn't care about me at all. You know, I had, I still, even though I left, had this like little part of me that was like, well, I hope he, I hope he at least cared about me. And, you know, it was a slow acceptance process that he never did. He never will. This is a game. This is a joke. This is, you were one of many. And, you know, when another victim came forward, it was really helpful for me as we compared notes. It was hurtful to me, but it was very helpful in seeing that, like I just said, that, that this was just a, uh, a script he was reading from, you know, the, there was no real emotional concern for another human being ever. No. And I don't think I've ever encountered a sociopath in my life. So it was quite shocking and quite chilling to really see that and see, you know, see that up close instead of just on TV. And should I stop there or do you want me to go on with just the healing? Oh, I love the healing thing. If I can add just okay. one, thing. one of the things that I was it, it, I'm, I'm sure so gratifying and that I'm so proud of you is that there were other victims and yeah. when you spoke and the other one of the other victims spoke up and you asked well how did you get out and her answer was I didn't I didn't it was only because you spoke up and shut him down that her abuse stopped That's so right. you saved another person I mean you probably saved many people but you saved her I I know that was that was so amazing. And I remember saying to her, because she spoke up for me, not knowing me, spoke up for me when the gossip mill was in full swing at the church that we both attended with the abuser. And I said, I will be forever grateful to you for standing up to me. And she said, I will be forever, ever grateful for you for getting me away from that man. And it's just, it's just huge. You know, my mind was blown. Like you said, she said, I didn't. And I'm like, what do you mean you didn't? And she's like, my last session was the day before the medical board came and, you know, confronted him and then he pretended to retire. So she was trapped and she had been for a very long time. And, you know, I can relate to that now. I wasn't there as long, but I get it. And I, and I feel like I can relate more to domestic violence now because I get that now how somebody can be an abuser and a comforter. It's very confusing, but you know, it happened to me so I can relate. And I think that is huge as you can help people to open their eyes as to how, because a lot of times when you see something like this from the outside, it's, well, why don't you just stop going? Well, or, or if it's an abusive relationship, why don't you just leave them? And, and when you're not inside it and recognize that manipulative, twisted, confusing situation that you're in. And so I appreciate you explaining that to help someone to be able from the outside to see it from the inside so they can say, oh, okay. Oh, I can see how that could be. Because yeah. like you said, confusing. You have someone who is professing to help you and to care about you and then using twisted forms of religion in there and trying to make this a spiritual thing when really uh, nothing to do with that. Ugh. Okay, yuck. All right, so you went to Canada and you met a new friend. Yeah. Then I love that you saw hearts everywhere and just kind of had that feeling of one, I'm not alone. Someone else has been uh, in an experience where they were um, manipulated and abused. And also that feeling that God loves me. Yeah, that was huge. I mean, the fact that God loves me so much that he would send me somebody going through an identical experience to me was just mind blowing to me. 
you know, it's funny because every time God does something amazing, I'm surprised and I'm shocked and I don't know why we are, but it's like, I can't even believe that he could do that, you know? And then, uh, yeah, he started to love on me in the way that he was loving on her because he knew I loved photography and photography and nature. And since I, since my faith had come alive, I would seek God in nature and I would take pictures. So he knew that. So he sent me, you know, just hearts in nature everywhere. And, you know, I know, know now that he was loving on me and building me up because he knew the journey I had ahead of me that I'm really still on, you know, the healing journey and the recovering from this. And he, you know, he knew what lay ahead and wanted me to be prepared. I'm so glad. And I also love the comment when you came back home and you saw another heart and had just that little feeling of what you think I can only see you in Canada. I mean, I, I know I was like, there. you're coming, <laughs> God, you're coming with me. And I was, he, I, I could hear him say, did you think I just lived in Canada? And I'm like, well, I guess at least I didn't think you yes, lived sir. in my Where's state. God? He no. lives in Canada. <laughs> I'm sure God has to shake his head at us all the time. Like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I thought, I thought I was saying goodbye to that experience forever. I didn't think I would encounter him in that way ever again. I thought it was just at that beach in Canada and it was just special and just to be remembered. <laughs> hmm. And sometimes we do have to have those beautiful spiritual moments and hold on to them and treasure them. It doesn't mean that we won't ever get another one, but right. they are sometimes there there's big spaces between and maybe they're happening and we're not noticing them. I don't know. But right. sometimes when we have something special like that, we do have to hold on to it and, and, and use that as a security blanket through times when we don't feel it. It's true. I mean, the intensity is not always like that. You know, as we know, God doesn't always show up like that in huge spectacular rainbows and things, but I do think he's always there in a quieter way that, you know, we get busy and don't notice, but it was cute because when I came back and of course I'm noticing hearts and I'm taking pictures and my kids are like, oh, mom, you know, hurry up, you know, because I'm lagging behind or I'm looking at rocks that are shaped like hearts. But then they got into it too. And then I'd hear one of my little kids from across the house, mom, I'd come all the way back. What? There's a heart shape. I'm like, oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet. That's yeah, cute. And hopefully we clarify to the listeners. I can't remember if I mentioned or not. But that was to you a, a, a symbol that God loves me. I, I'm seeing his love, his love. He's showing it to me. Yeah. So that was super important. And if it's okay, let's talk a little bit about when you were very, very young, you were abused. And I believe that this uh, early encounter with abuse helps make that mental shift of, like you said, I don't matter people on authority, um, they, they are to be trusted. You just have to do what they say, even if you don't like it. And that type of, of, uh, I would say almost grooming that enabled the future abuse started when you were three. Right. Yeah. I feel like, you know, early abuse of all kinds places a target on our backs. <clears throat> and oftentimes we don't even realize it's there. And we wonder why we keep having repeated abuse experiences, or we keep attracting the same type of people. And we have to really uncover what those rules are, those messages that we're playing in our head and address them, you know, so that these patterns will stop. But um, when I was very young, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that was the beginning. And then when I was 12, I was molested again by a priest. And that took a huge huge toll on me. And I, I remember I didn't want to tell my mom at the time because she had cancer and wasn't supposed to survive it. And, you know, I knew that would devastate her being, cause she was so religious and, you know, so I kept it to myself and then, um, it just kind of kept happening, um, like a swim coach and then, you know, a doctor in my twenties. And every time I would just freeze and, you know, I just thought these things wouldn't happen to a normal person. I mean, there's something wrong with you that you attract this. And, you know, I think too, as children, we want to believe a little bit that it's our fault because if it's our fault, then we can figure out how to fix it because it's much less terrifying to think that way than it is to think this is the reality that I live in. Everyone, you know, people are scary. I can't spot the monsters from the nice people. Um, and that's a really scary, you know, way to, to, to see the world. And so 
I think that's one of the reasons that we decided it is our fault. And I eventually developed an eating disorder as a teen. And a lot of that was, you know, partly the self-hatred that I carried and partly trying to grasp some control um, in a world that felt very out of control to me. Wow. Okay. You are a survivor, Amy. You are a survivor. That is, I am so sorry for the things that you've gone through. That is awful. Awful, awful, awful. Thank you. And then as you're making the shift, a mental shift to know this is not okay. And then you had another therapist who was um, actually helpful, a um, little, little cold, professional, but, but helpful. And you use the EMDR. Yes. Um, was that, did that take a long time? We did EMDR for a year, just on the abuse with the doctor for a year, every week. That's how long it took, you know, just to get that shift in intensity. EMDR, I'm just not speaking as a doctor. I'm just speaking as a patient. It lessens the intensity of the trauma around a very specific event. And so it was like a really exciting day when I realized that that was no longer the most pressing issue in my life. And, you know, we could move on because I didn't think that day would ever come. I'm so glad that it did. Have you been able to address the other abuse issues or instances? Which, what do you mean, which ones? Well, any of them. I mean, I mean, did you continue the EMDR or are you just once you took care? Oh, of I see what you're saying. Um, well, yeah, and you'll, you'll read about it in the book, but the relationship between she and I had an unfortunate ending because she became very angry that she got, she had to fill out some, a request for my medical records that had to do with the lawsuit I was in. And she just started yelling at me and threatening me. And for once I was able to just pick up my things and leave. And, you know, that was a huge um, accomplishment for me to be able to see that I'm not being treated properly and just walk away. So, um, so no, I, and I did not, I did not go back and do more EMDR, but I'll tell you, um, maybe a couple of years later, it's like traumas like this are like earthquakes. They happen and then there's an aftershock and then there's an aftershock and it just kind of keeps happening. And so, you know, the ripple effect eventually, you know, my marriage was falling apart and needed work and we sought counseling. And then, you know, and my children were having issues related to what I went through. And so we were in trauma crisis mode for quite a few years. And I did seek out another therapist who helped me through that. But to address all of those past issues and past abuses, it was really my faith that, um, that helped me there. I mean, there's so many pieces, but it was kind of seeing those rules written out on paper. That was crazy to see what I was allowing in, um, replacing those rules with who God said I was. So God used this trauma with this therapist to not only heal me from that abuse and free me from that cage, but he used it then to free me from all the past abuse and the cage that I was really had myself in, um, which is why on the cover of my book, there's a female holding the cage um, because I was, you know, par partly responsible for keeping myself in there. And so, you know, God just, it took years and it took, I, I wrote love letters from God to myself, which may sound silly, but I just, you know, threw everything at him. Like, but, but God, I didn't, I could, I didn't even leave sooner. Like I'm such a loser. Like I'm an adult. And I, you know, and I just told him everything and let him come back to me and come back to me with his love and his acceptance. And I did that over and over and over until I could feel a shift and the self-hatred started to lessen. So to answer your question, I, it wasn't EMDR. Um, it was really you're replacing, fine. you know, the messages with who God says I am and who God says we all are. And when you realize how God sees you and you can feel that, it's amazing. Your life goes from black and white to color. Wow. I love that. Okay. So <laughs> as I'm trying to, to put all the pieces together to help me understand better, 
this healing process, which is a combination of lots of different um, facets, included that the EMDR, and for those who are listening who aren't familiar with this, this is a, a technique to help relieve trauma. It's one of the things that's mentioned in Dr. Um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. And, um, and then, so we have these, these wonderful tools that have been created that we can go to a professional and get some help with. And then there's the aspect of faith and being able to recognize our relationship with God and also the way uh, that we see the world, the way that we see him, the way that we see ourselves and the way that we interact. And again, my favorite part of the book was you making that shift from I am garbage to I am the daughter of a king. And I might not have the wording exactly right, but that was what I was thinking of. No, I do say that. Yeah. When I had that eating disorder, I would run on the treadmill and chant over and over, you are trash, you are garbage, you are garbage. And yeah, so that's quite a shift to you are daughter of a king, you are royalty, you are precious, you are loved. And, and you know, I just want to say for those who maybe their faith has been shaken or they don't have as strong of a faith, because I've also been there. I lived there for most of my life, um, angry with God and not understanding why he allowed these things to happen that, you know, in this healing journey, you know, he uses a lot of different things. So, you know, he used, there's different support groups that I've participated in, you know, he, in the very beginning, I, beginning, I just needed to know that I wasn't alone. And I found an organization that supports um, victims of adult victim and uh, clergy abuse. And I just needed to hear in those first weeks, it's not your fault and you're not alone over and over and over. And so I only say that because I just want people to understand that it's a long, slow journey. And I kind of talk about it. It's like climbing a mountain when you are traversing back and forth and back and forth. It feels very flat. It does not feel like you're making much progress. But then when you stop, you know, a year or two in and look down, you realize I have come way farther than I thought. And so I guess I just say that because I don't want it to feel like I said a prayer and then I was better. I appreciate that clarification. And I know you know that, but I just I'm say listening. That. Yes, 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 yes. The whole idea of we have aha moments, right? I mean, you had an aha moment when the doctor said something that you just said, uh, no, no. But, but an aha moment does not mean a complete healing. It wasn't a complete transformation. It was a necessary flipping on an on switch to, to a new direction. But like right. you mentioned that the, the process is, is slow and we need to be patient with ourselves and yes. compassionate. That's why I bring it up because I was not patient with myself. I would ask these women, it, the organization is called Tell. And I would say, how come I'm not better? It's been a year, it's been two years. And they would just, you know, over and over, it takes time. And I think, well, Again, um, a normal person, you know, there is no normal in healing, but I should be farther along. It, it, it is however long it takes. And um, there was something I was going to say, and now I think it's evaded me. Um, oh, even the attachment to the abuser took a long time before it went away for good. I mean, months, maybe. It was because it's so painful and confusing and to accept, you know, that somebody can use you like your trash, that, that that really meant nothing. It, it's you for a long time, hold on to that um, belief that, you know, you still kind of hope you were special in, in some way. So I, I guess I just throw that out there too, that those attachments are also slow. Cause there's a lot of victims that I talk to and they're like, why do I still kind of miss my abuser? You know, why do I, and I, I said, you know what, when I first got out months down the road, um, I was probably already into my um, medical board suit and everything. I thought, if, what, will, what will happen if I see him in public? And I thought, part of me thought I would punch him in the face and part of me thought I would hug him. You know, so I had equally conflicting emotions. Wow, and that does make things very challenging and very confusing. I'm so proud of you, really, that you've come such a long way. And because you did it, not only did you immediately help to save someone, but as your story gets out and people recognize that this can happen, 
And like you said, you're not alone. It's not your fault. Yes, you didn't catch the red flags, but that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you didn't catch the red flags. Yeah. So, and sometimes, and I know people don't understand, so they don't mean this with ill will, but sometimes I'll hear that, you know, victims of childhood sexual abuse don't have boundaries anymore. And that's why we get abused. And that is absolutely not true. I did not walk around without boundaries. In fact, I was very guarded. It took me a very long time to trust this, this man, this therapist. But, you know, for therapy to work, we have to let down our guard, you know, and be open. So it's something I tried to make myself do. It isn't that we don't have the boundaries. It's that we don't think that we have the right to enforce them. Mm, boy, that's an important clarification. It really is. Because one of them is shaming I feel like, and the other one is more accurate. Okay. That's, that's, that's important to know. Any of those little twists and those little distinctions that make it so that we're more accurate in um, understanding things. I think that's very important. Yeah. Now, one other thing is you, you mentioned people don't understand and you were so brave. Not only did you get out, but then you took action and that ended up going into court and, and that was rough. That was so rough. And I am so sorry about that. But um, a lot of times our people get away with things because when you're in a court situation, you get attacked. Yeah. And it's, it's hard when you're already feeling uh, vulnerable and, and low and all of the things and, and feeling like, oh, it's my fault. And then someone yells at you and says, it's your fault in a public setting. That that's, uh, yes. it's hard. so thanks for, thanks for standing up for yourself. Thanks for moving forward. You did a good thing. Thank you. I, I agree. And it was part of my healing, finding my voice and standing up. And it was also part of, um, ditching the shame once and for all to come forward because I'm not embarrassed and I'm not ashamed that I was a victim of a felony. You know, one of my very favorite comments towards the end of the book was when I got to speak to that psychologist and he said, you know, did you tell your husband? And I said, yeah, I told him everything, you know, because that's the person I am. I'm honest. I, if I make it, if I think I do something wrong, I tell everything. And he said, well, that's a shame because the first thing I do when I sit down with couples in this situation is to tell the partner that your wife, let's just say it was a wife instead of the husband, because they do get abused too, but your wife was a victim of a felony. And you know, do victims of crimes owe explanations to others? No, they don't. You know, when, when, when somebody is sexually assaulted or assaulted, or we see something on the news, we don't think, you know, there are certain crimes that we immediately side with the victim. But with adult sexual abuse, people immediately side with the abuser. And in most cases, because they don't want to believe it could happen to them. They don't want to believe that somebody that they respected and trusted was actually a predator, because then what does that say about them? You know what I mean? So they, they tend to, um, to blame the victim. I think I went off on a tangent there, so I apologize. <laughs> no, not at all. I think that's an important clarification. Again, because as, as we're speaking here to, to anyone, someone who is, is learning about this for the first time, maybe never even knew that this sort of thing took place, people who have been in that experience, I think it helps to just awaken the awareness to say, okay, so if you're hearing about something like this for the first time and your knee-jerk reaction is, well, she probably deserved it. Why didn't she walk away? Why didn't she? She probably da 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 da. I, I'd like you to pause. And rethink that a little bit, because there's more to the story than you understand. And if that's as far as you can handle right now, let's just say, okay, there's probably more to the story than I understand, because I guarantee there is. And there, you know, I say this a lot, but there is no consensual in a relationship with an extreme imbalance of power. It is not possible to give consent, even if you think that you did in a relationship with an imbalance of power, because you don't have any of the control and they have all of it. So, you know, there's victims that hate themselves and beat themselves up forever thinking, well, I think I might've participated or, you know, maybe I, maybe I led him on or something. And, you know, that's another huge piece of forgiving yourself and understanding is that no, that, you know, there, there's no consent in that, in that case. That's why we protect children 
because there's an imbalance of power. And that's why we protect elderly, an imbalance of power. And when you're sitting alone in a doctor's office or a therapist's office with no other witnesses, and it's you and a professional, you and a physician, um, you don't have much power. And, you know, if it's going to be a he said, she said, and you're likely not going to come out on top, you know? Right. But if I'm going to add just a teeny bit of a tweak and clarification, I think there's a perception of power. I think you are more powerful than you realized. You felt absolutely powerless and everything that you said is true. Um, And I'm not disagreeing at all. But what I am saying is when we look at this type of situation, if, if someone who has been a victim feels like I, I, I have no power, I would love instead of looking for the blame, I, it's my fault or whatever, to say, how can I get my power back? I mean, yeah. even the power to say no, the power to walk away, um, I understand that we can feel powerless. But my goal is to help empower people to recognize, actually, I do have power. And I think that is part of the the, the beauty of healing, of transforming victims into survivors. Who wants to stay a victim? I mean, a victim, victimization happens, but we don't want it to happen again. We want to be survivors and say, okay, this happened, did not like it, was not in control, not my fault, but it's not going to happen again. Yeah. And I, I think when you were speaking, I was thinking, I completely agree with you, but I was thinking there are many relationships, like I was mentioning, you know, whatever political leaders, celebrities, whatever we, we attribute more power to them. But what we need to remember, I think, because I do feel like say in the situation of a physician and a patient, I do feel like you are in the lesser position of power in that relationship, but what key for abuse victims is to realize that we have equal value. Ooh. Okay. Okay. I like that. Maybe, maybe we don't share that power, you know, that they have, they do have a little bit more, they have more say, they have more clout, (laughs) maybe more ability, you know, whether it's perceived or not, they do have that because society gives it to them, attributes it to them. Okay. You know, um, I think we all kind of do that. Um, just if somebody is our elder, you know, we, we just associate, you know, we are sort of under them. Does that make sense? They should be wiser. I mean, they should be wiser. They should be better. They should, but anyway, so it's the value. Oh, thank you, Amy. Okay, so we're, we're trying to kind of clarify a little bit of clarify a little bit this way, clarify a little bit. This way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so rather than saying equal power, because we don't, how about equal value? Because equal value. I'm a child of God and you're a child of God and whoever else is a child of God, that, that's a level playing field. We can start yeah. there. Yeah, and that is huge. It gives me the chills because if you, if you know that you have equal value because you do, then yeah, you don't have to accept anything. You know, it doesn't. It would, and that's, that's why, you know, past abuse and bullying and all kinds of abuse that tells us we don't have value. We're sitting ducks, you know, we're sitting ducks for predators and abusers until we recognize, you know, that we do have value. And it's really hard to get that back once it's been taken away from you. Absolutely. It is very hard. And I'm proud of you for showing the way. Amy, thank you for being so brave and thank you for visiting with me today. It was so much fun. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Carl Jung. He said, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Today, I invite you to stop defining yourself by what may have happened to you, but instead to choose who you are and who you want to become. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org. 
For free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This An Action Plan to Calm Fear, Anxiety, Worry, and Stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.